Welcome to our webinar, Behavior Changes in Individuals with Down Syndrome, which is presented by the Adult Down Syndrome Center in Park Ridge, Illinois. Next slide. Before we begin, these are just a couple reminders. We are recording this webinar and the link will be sent to anyone who registered for the webinar within one week. We will also share the slides from this webinar. Please note, this webinar is intended for educational purposes only. If you have specific questions about a loved one, we recommend bringing those questions to a healthcare professional or other qualified professional who you work with. Next slide. As I mentioned, um, we are from the Adult Down Syndrome Center. We're located in Park Ridge, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. And we are a healthcare clinic for adolescents and adults with Down syndrome. And we begin seeing patients at age 12. In addition to providing medical care, we also offer educational opportunities such as this one, as well as social skills groups and other groups for individuals with Down syndrome. Next slide, please. These are our presenters today. Our first presenter is Dr. Brian Chicoin. He's the medical director of the Adult Down Syndrome Center. Our second presenter is Dr. Katie Frank, and she is an occupational therapist at our center. And lastly, we have Abby, and Abby Raleigh is our licensed clinical social worker. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Shacoin. Thank you, Laura. Um, so what we're gonna, uh work to do today is to first to divine, uh, define behavior change and then identify some reasons for behavioral changes and then discuss strategies and solutions uh, to address those changes. And now next slide. And so what, what is a behavioral uh, change? So we're, what we're looking at today is the definition we're going to use is a new action or pattern of actions that are atypical for an individual. So the focus today is on a change in behavior. Next slide. <clears throat> so important to note that we're, again, we're talking about a behavior change and, and a behavior change is not always bad. Um, you know, we had some folks during the pandemic who you know, really uh, knuckled down and, and uh, increased their uh, healthy uh, nutrition and habits and, and exercise uh, significantly more. Uh, and so that, that obviously was a behavior change, but it was a, a very important and good behavior change. So not good, not all behavior change is bad. Um, certainly not all behavior change needs to be addressed. Um, uh, really, uh, it may be a natural part of development and aging, or it may just be uh, inconsequential change. Um, uh, however, um, However, if, uh, um, you know, if the behavior is interfering with the individual's ability to function effectively, uh, or maybe it's annoying to the individual or to the family, and it's maybe impacting their safety or their health, uh, you know, so those would things we'd want to take a look at and see if there, a change needs to be, change needs to be made. Um, does the it, behavior interfere with development and learning? Are the behaviors disruptive to the family, the school, the workplace? Uh, is the behavior potentially harmful to themselves or others? And is, is the behavior different enough from what they may be typically displayed by someone with, or that is typically displayed by someone of comparable developmental age? So lots of things to consider whether even it needs to be addressed. Uh, and then certainly once that's determined, if it, if it does, then we'll go from there on, on how that might be addressed. Uh, next slide. So next is what, what, cause, what can cause a behavior change? So really lots, lots of things, and we're going to, uh, I'll focus on, on some of these here that today. It might be a communication issue. There may be a function, a, 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 in a sense, of a benefit from, from doing that behavior. There may be a mental health issue. There uh, may be, maybe this is part of uh, the person's, uh, uh, what we call common characteristics of people with Down syndrome. Not everybody with Down syndrome has them, but many people with Down syndrome have, have some of these characteristics and, and, and there may be a, a reason why some of that is changing. There might be a sensory issue that's uh, impacting the person's behavior. Certainly life stressors. Uh, um, there are brain anatomy issues in people with Down syndrome that may uh, ultimately affect behavior. And then certainly any physical health problem has the potential to affect uh, behavior as well. So we're gonna talk about more about these in detail, but I just wanted to 
kind of uh, give you a little um, kind of overview of what we're going to do. Uh, we will, just as a disclaimer, we will not uh, be focusing on any one condition such as uh, Down syndrome regression disorder or Alzheimer's disease, uh, both of which can contribute to behavior change in some individuals. Uh, next slide. So let's start with some physical health issues. So certainly uh, people with Down syndrome uh, that are, are suffering pain, uh, sometimes they have difficulty uh, sharing that. And so you may see it come out as a, a behavioral change rather than a complaint of my knee hurts or my back hurts or, or, or some other uh, source of discomfort. Uh, we see significantly more vitamin B12 deficiency in people with Down syndrome. Some of that may be due to celiac disease, but there may be other reasons as well. Uh, and that can affect uh, people's behavioral or uh, psychological uh, function. Uh, celiac disease or other gastrointestinal issues that may be associated with pain. It may be associated with vitamin deficiency. Uh, it may be associated with just not feeling well. And, and that ends up uh, causing the individual to uh, behave differently. Certainly vision or hearing impairment are very important. Uh, again, problems that are uh, probably significantly more common in people with Down syndrome. And, and, can, and the loss of a sense or the decline of a, in a sense uh, can be very uh, detrimental to someone's uh, sense of well-being and contribute to uh, a behavioral change. Uh, sleep apnea is significantly more common in people with Down syndrome, uh, and that can uh, certainly uh, result in behavioral or psychological change as well. Hypothyroidism, underactive thyroid, hyperthyroidism, overactive thyroid, both conditions are more common in people with Down syndrome, and both can contribute to uh, changes uh, in, in behavior. Uh, atlantoaxial instability, which is the first vertebrae uh, Flipping on the second, causing the pinching of the spinal cord. Years ago, we saw a young man with uh, that was thought to be depressed because he was putting his head on the desk in school, uh, and it ended up being he had atlantoaxial instability, and, and his neck was loose enough, if you will, that he was having a hard time holding his head up throughout the course of the day. So his his was had nothing to do with uh, a psychological issue; it had to do with a, a physical uh, issue of the, the instability of his neck. And then certainly Alzheimer's disease, which is unfortunately more common in people with Down syndrome, uh, can contribute to uh, uh, a change in behavior. It's not always some of you know, these bigger diagnosable things, or, uh, you know, kind of bigger issues. Sometimes it's relatively small issues. Uh, a cerumen impaction, the earwax uh, filling the ear canals, impairing uh, hearing can cause contribute to behavioral change. It might be an ingrown toenail or constipation or sport, poor sleep due to environmental issues. There really can be many, many issues that contribute to a change in behavior. Um, uh, next slide. And then the other, the other thing to consider is the issue of uh, common characteristics. Now, again, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, these are issues that are, are uh, common in people with Down syndrome, but certainly not universal. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, take it with, with that understanding. Um, so, one of the common characteristics is self-talk. We see a lot of people with Down syndrome talk to themselves. And, and over time, we've really felt that this was, in a sense, a developmental stage of appropriate behavior. But it's also used as a coping strategy. It's used sometimes when people are bored. Um, and, and it can be a way to work through problems. Um, and, but the real key in and of itself is not the self-talk. But if, if there's a change in the quality or the quantity or the frequency uh, of the, of the uh, self-talk, and that may be a sign of stress, physical, mental, social, uh, or, or some uh, physical or mental health uh, a problem. So a change again, a change is, is is the key. Just as we're talking about change in behavior, uh, the groove is a tendency towards sameness or repetition. Where people with Down syndrome, many of them tend to do things uh, in a, in a pattern or in a in a routine. Uh, and and uh, again, the, considering that the change would be uh, you know, and again, this can be very functional for people with Down syndrome. But a change may be a sign of of, of something else going on. Uh, we may see the individual uh, have increased grooves where they're, they're becoming more and more rigid. Or we may see someone that has a, a good groove pattern that really is very functional for them, and then they start to lose that, and, and they're not able to function as well as they lose that groove. So those, those would all merit a further evaluation. Uh, people with Down syndrome tend to have a strong visual memory, uh, and, and, um, uh, and so that's good. They tend to be good at remembering the visual data, like videos or movies. Uh, and and uh, sometimes people with Down syndrome will experience uh, a memory almost as if it's happening uh, here and now. Uh, you know, they have such strong visual memories. They're almost kind of like replay it in their head. They seem to be able to almost replay it in their head uh, and and uh, like like it's happening now. And, and that can be a very positive thing. Uh, and, and it's certainly something that we use a lot in, as far as helping people with Down syndrome in, 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 uh, when they have a change in behavior, which you'll see a little bit in a little bit. 
Um, but sometimes it can be a negative thing where, where a bad memory is, is, is very strongly held on to and very, very vivid to them. And that can be a challenge sometimes. And then something we call empathy radar, which by and large seems to be a very positive thing where many people with Down syndrome are very sensitive to the feelings of others and, and, and uh, you know, can kind of sense that there's something going on and, and uh, uh, you know, sort of empathize with the, with the other person. But sometimes that can be a bit of a challenge when there's a lot of uh, stress going on around them that they kind of absorb all that. And, and that can be a challenge for them. So in and of itself, it, it can be a good thing. But again, when there's a change or there's uh, something else going on, that, that, that can be a problem. Um, next, uh, next slide. And so I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Abby. Thank you. So another area that may cause um, a change in behavior is the brain anatomy. So people with Down syndrome can have different brain structures. Um, we know that the prefrontal cortex is responsible for impulse control, emotional regulation, higher level reasoning, executive functioning. The hippocampus is, can, is responsible for learning and memory, and the cerebellum for language and memory processing. And sometimes these areas may be smaller or less developed in people with Down syndrome. We also know that the brain, excuse me, develops and matures and changes throughout our lifespan. So as these changes are happening for people with Down syndrome, they can cause behavioral changes, which might look like an increase in impulsive behavior or really having difficulty planning or initiating tasks, difficulty expressing themselves or receiving information as it's um, spoken to them. Next slide, please. Thank you. So mental health can also be another cause of uh, behavior change. And we do see these conditions come up pretty frequently in our population depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, and Down syndrome regression disorder. And we're talking about the diagnoses of mental health conditions. Sometimes as a society, we um, can use these terms sort of offhandedly saying, you know, I'm so depressed, or I'm a little bit OCD about this or that. Um, but we need to consider, you know, the diagnostic criteria of what really qualifies as depression, anxiety, OCD, or Down syndrome regression disorder. Um, so we want to think about, is this person just sad or do they meet the criteria for depression? Are they a little bit nervous about a certain situation or has it reached the level of truly being anxiety? Um, changes in mood are normal and so not always indicative of a mental health uh, concern or a mental illness, but it is something to keep an eye on. Um, we hear a lot of times you know, how do we differentiate between what's obsessive compulsive disorder and what is the groove as Dr. Um, Chicoine just sort of discussed. And it's really, you know, kind of about that control and is the habit they're doing something that they're doing despite not wanting to um, or being even to the point of discomfort doing it because it's no longer in their control, which we would classify more as, you know, obsessive compulsive disorder versus um, the groove where it's just, it's something that brings them comfort and calm and it's part of their routine. We wanna think about when we're diagnosing mental health conditions, is this something that reaches the level of a diagnosis? Like for example, did they just lose some of their reading skills over the summer or have they had a significant loss of function over a period of time? Again, are they just sad for a few days here and there or are they consistently sad, social withdrawal for over two weeks, most days, meeting those criteria? So if we're looking at mental health conditions, some behavior changes that we might see would be social withdrawal, crying, difficulty sleeping, um, preoccupation uh, with their obsessions with you know, a specific person or place or event, um, compulsions that make it difficult for them to function in their daily life, some increased confusion or difficulty with memory. Those are some areas that we would look at in the mental health realm. Next slide, please. Life stressors can also be a big cause of behavior change. Um, one thing that we say is that stress or trauma are in the eye of the beholder. What might be not at all stressful to me might be extremely stressful to somebody else and vice versa. So we want to look at 
what's going on in the individual's life. If there are other things going on at the same time as the behavior change, it may be a life stressor for them. So things like changes in their normal routine, um, some situations that come at, come up at school or work. Friendships and relationships is one an area we see a lot as causing a lot of stress. And this can refer to you know, family relationships, romantic, coworkers, friends, acquaintances. Sometimes there's some drama that comes up or some um, confusion about social interactions and that can cause stress. Um, we may even see a behavior change, you know, when like school is out for the summer and there's that gap between when summer school or programming starts and the individual has to sort of recalibrate and adjust to a whole new routine. Um, we might see somebody sort of storm off during a conversation, either because they can't keep up with the back and forth or um, they're not being understood with, when they're trying to communicate. So these are areas that it can be extremely stressful. We also know grief and loss are big areas and that um, people with Down syndrome do experience grief and loss sometimes on a different timeline than people without Down syndrome. So it might take a little bit of sleuthing to determine if this, if there was a situation that didn't just immediately happen, but it can still be a life stressor for them even months or an extended period of time after the event itself. Um, so sometimes when, the, when individuals with Down syndrome are experiencing life stressors, we might see increased rigidity or agitation or some refusal behaviors to do things that they previously would have done. Um, sometimes some obsessions with individuals, for example, if it's a, a stressor about friendships or relationships, or sometimes perseverating on a topic or an event. Next slide, please. Okay, so we, when we talk about the function of the behavior, we want to find out what is the purpose? What is this behavior serving or doing for the individual? And we say this is sort of just one part of determining the strategies in order to address the behavior. Because we really believe that behavior is communication. And by assessing the function of the behavior, we can really try to figure out what the individual with Down syndrome is trying to communicate. So the areas that we look at are attention, access, escaping, avoiding, or sensory. So we wanna try to figure out, is the individual with this new behavior, are they seeking or avoiding attention? Are they seeking access to a preferred person, place, or thing? Are they trying to escape or avoid a certain person, place, or thing? Are they seeking or avoiding sensory input? Those are some of the general categories that we look at when we try to pinpoint what might be causing this behavior change. We have to look at the whole picture though when we do this. We're looking at what's happening at the time of the behavior, the environment, antecedents and the consequences so that we can determine what function or what purpose this behavior is serving. And sometimes the environment or things going on in our lives or even we ourselves might accidentally be reinforcing behaviors that we don't want to see um, by providing attention, for example. So looking at the function of the behavior and what the individual is trying to communicate can be really helpful when we're looking at how to address it. And again, this is kind of just a piece of the puzzle. Yeah. Um, so we might see behaviors um, such as, for example, eloping to avoid a non-preferred environment or task, touching others without permission to gain their attention or to gain the attention of others, screaming in public, kind of to get what they want. That's kind of the classic example of, you know, throwing a tantrum, a child throwing a tantrum in the grocery store. The parent wants to avoid a scene, gives them the candy bar. Well, we've just reinforced the behavior and they gained access to what they wanted to gain access to. So when we look at function, that kind of informs our strategies for addressing the behavior. We can move to the next slide and I will pass it off to Dr. Frank. Thank you so much. So one of the other possible causes for behavior could be communication. And we've talked about that a little bit with um, 
when Abby talked about the function, right? But what is the person trying to tell us? What are their needs and desires? And really with individuals with Down syndrome, we often see that their receptive language or what they understand is better than their expressive language, what they're able to communicate verbally. And so some individuals with Down syndrome are verbal, some may use augmentative or alternative communication devices. Some may just use gestures. So it's important to know how that person communicates. So if there are some challenges with communication, we might see refusal behaviors. We might see the person just shut down. They may escape social situations or they may throw or hit because they can't tell you that they don't want you to be in their space or they don't want to um, you know, do that activity. And then the final uh, cause, possible cause for behavior would be sensory. And this is problems with the ability to process information received through our senses. And so it could be sight, sound, touch, taste, or smell, our common senses, but it also could be how our um, we feel these senses through our body. So whether it's in our muscles and joints, has to do with our balance, or even internally, things like our heart rate and our ability to feel thirst or hunger. And so how do you tell really if it's a sensory issue? And um, one thing is, let's say you, the person's doing um, this action, again, going back to Abby's example in the grocery store, and you think they actually do want the candy bar, so you give it to them, but they still are throwing the tantrum, right? Or you give them that candy bar and they're just not able to calm down. So in that case, it might not be that they're wanting access to the candy bar. It could be some other, um, something in the sensory environment or within their own body that is making it hard for them to control their emotions. And then the last thing is, is the response the same with everyone? And if it is, um, then it's probably sensory or if it's in a certain environment, uh, Right, so they only have these behaviors in school. It could be something about the school environment and their way that they're processing the information in that environment that could be leading to the sensory issue and therefore the behavior. So again, when it comes to sensory issues, we may see refusal behaviors or escaping, eloping. They might throw or hit. They may run into people or push people or they're constantly touching others. They might self-stim, so whether it's hand flapping or flapping some other um, item that they like or rocking or spinning. Uh, so what I think you can see uh, when we talk about these causes for behavior is that even though we've talked about eight different possible causes, the behaviors may all kind of overlap where, you know, you heard us say refusal or escape for many of these. And so that's why it can, it can be very challenging to address behavior. So with that, I'm going to pass it back over to Dr. Chacoin. Thank you, Katie. Um, so how, how do we address uh, behavior change? Uh, next slide. So again, we'll come back to, as an overview, come back to this um, this slide where, uh, as Katie mentioned, the eight things. There's it, it can be uh, one or more of these, and sometimes there's a lot of interaction between these. So sometimes, as, as Katie mentioned, can be a little tricky to to sort out. Uh, but that's that's the challenge to keep to looking for uh, what uh, uh, other factors may be contributing to this as as we work through this. Next slide. So uh, certainly as, as a physician, one of the things that certainly I focus on is, is some of the physical health issues. And we see uh, lots of uh, uh, what might be uh, just diagnosed as a mental health issues, but really it, it's more of a physical health uh, cause. And so we really wanna look at those things and, and assess for those things as well as do the things we can do to prevent them from ever occurring in the first place. So we encourage regular checkups uh, with, with the, the person's provider. To, to look for uh, you know, potential brewing health conditions or to discuss uh, uh, healthy behaviors to uh, stay, you know, stay physically healthy and hopefully uh, stay mentally and behaviorally healthy as well. We encourage you know, regular exercise and healthy eating, all of which seem to uh, uh, promote uh, both physical and mental health and, and the opposite if not done, uh, seem to uh, detract from physical and mental health both. Um, we see many people with Down syndrome uh, in the office that really uh, don't drink enough fluids. 
and and uh, being uh, you know mildly or even moderately dehydrated going through life like that people don't feel well and and they don't they don't function as well and so there's likely to be changes in behavior they may not have uh, toler as tolerant of uh, other factors uh, you know some of those other seven factors may play a role and, and if they're not well hydrated they may react more negatively to one of those than they might otherwise certainly sleep is so important uh, we do know that unfortunately people with down syndrome or other intellectual disabilities have more sleep challenges in general but also people with down syndrome have a lot more sleep apnea and so really taking a look at those assessing for those uh, issues and, and making sure those are addressed uh, is very very important Certainly, we encourage uh, regular vaccines in our practice. That, uh, we do know that the immune system of people with Down syndrome doesn't always function as well as it might otherwise. And, and so uh, trying to do what we can to keep people from uh, getting infectious diseases or, or certainly getting uh, very ill from those infectious diseases. Certainly, medication management. Uh, if the person has, uh, has a physical health problem, that uh, we want to make sure we stay on top of that, that the medication is at the right dose, I think, and at the right time, uh, taken, you know, appropriately on an empty stomach or a full stomach. You know, lots of issues with the medications. We wanna make sure those are being addressed so that the person uh, is, is staying healthy or improving their health. Uh, and then certainly health screening. Uh, we encourage regular health screening. And, and, and we do, uh, as, as you might've seen in the Global Down Syndrome Healthcare Guidelines for adults, you can see that there are some differences in the health screening for people with Down Syndrome based on differences in different uh, health conditions, as well as um, other factors that uh, went into the into uh, what what would be appropriate for a person with Down syndrome. So all those things to uh, optimize health and and to minimize the uh, uh, the negative effect of uh, uh, a health condition. Next slide. And again, we come back to the common characteristics again. And and, and I want to make sure we understand that the first word is common. Uh, and, and again, not universal, but uh, th these are things we see frequently, and so we do talk about them pretty regularly. So visuals, uh, you know, can be a very important strategy, and, and certainly Katie and uh, uh, Abby will talk more about that as we go along here. But visuals are a very important uh, strategy to to use, uh, whether it be videos or pictures uh, or uh, item, you know, things on the apps on the phones, things that can help people. Uh, remind them of of, of uh, healthy things and, and help uh, potentially to track them from uh, other things that are not as healthy. Uh, one of the one of the uh, in a sense a visual model, if you will, or a visual is is you know we think of that as pictures or videos or whatnot. But another visual, in a sense, is is the the ac action or activity of those around the person. So people with Down syndrome will often ha have uh, be strong modelers where they will imitate what's going on around them. And so we really got to kind of look at ourselves and look at those around us, uh, around the individual to see is, is there, um, are they seeing something that we would prefer uh, has, has becomes a behavior challenge for them? Uh, and, and so can we uh, uh, change the, the modeling that is being done for that individual? And a lot of people with Down syndrome, when used in a positive light, will, will uh, have um, developed excellent health habits uh, uh, by watching uh, excellent health habits of those around them. Um, certainly uh, making it a part of the routine. We, we talked about the groove. And so really uh, a lot of our, uh, the people we see, uh, once they get into that groove of a, of a healthy behavior, they do it better than most of the rest of us uh, because it has become so much a part of the routine. Uh, and then we do see that people with Down syndrome tend to be pretty concrete thinkers. And so really using very concrete teaching methods and the, uh, uh, Dr. Frank and Abby will talk more about that in a little bit here with some of the examples. Um, and the other thing we have found uh, that probably help is, is helpful in many for many individuals is uh, help people understand what we would like them to do, uh, what would be the healthy thing to do, rather than what not to do. So really, sort of direct someone to something rather than away from something. We tend to find uh, works uh, works well. Next slide, and I'll turn that over to Abby. Thank you. So knowing what we do about the differences in brain anatomy for people with Down syndrome, there are some strategies that we can use to accommodate for those differences. And one of those things being repetition, they might need to hear the same concept more than once, more than a few times for them to remember it. Now, that's not to say while you're sitting and talking with them, repeat it multiple times right in a row, but they do need re repetition over time to practice and for those um, sort of directions or skills to uh, be committed to their memory. 
We also encourage using simple language, um, as few words as you can when giving verbal directives. That's what sort of sticks better in the brain rather than lengthy explanations. We always say allow for processing time. If they're processing speed, their receptive language, it takes them longer to process what's being told to them. Build that into your conversation time. Let them think, let them formulate their response or give them time to initiate the task that you're asking them to do. We use a lot of visuals because we know that their visual memories are stronger in people with Down syndrome. So we create all sorts of visuals for desired behaviors or things that we'd like to help um, see more of for the individual. We also say use positive and direct language rather than, you know you're not supposed to run in the house. Why are you always running in the house? You know that's not safe. You could fall and get hurt. Please walk is a lot more effective in communicating the, uh, the point that you're trying to make and it will stick with them much better. It can also be really helpful if the school team or the residential staff or recreational staff, family, if everyone's using the same language to reinforce concepts, if there's a skill you're trying to teach, um, if everybody sort of gets on the same page with that, um, that helps with generalization so that they aren't saying, oh, well, that's just something I have to do when I'm at home. And that's just something I do when I'm at school. If everybody's saying it the same way, it helps them recognize that that's sort of an expectation or something that they can do in all environments. Next slide, please. Okay, so if it is the case that the individual with Down syndrome has a mental health condition, um, there are some strategies that we can uh, use to, to address that need. One of those being counseling or psychotherapy. And so, with the individual with Down syndrome, we use visuals in counseling as well, because that really can help um, get the point across and help them sort of understand the, the interplay between their thoughts and their feelings and their behaviors. So some of these visuals that I have on this slide are things like feelings charts um, to help them communicate how they're feeling. We also look at the one in the upper right hand corner, the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. A lot of times people, people in general, I will say, have a hard time understanding that the way we think affects the way we feel, which in turn affects our behavior. And it's, they all sort of interplay together. Um, so if we can sort of separate out that you can have a thought about something, it can cause you to feel a certain way, you get to choose the behavior. So if I'm feeling angry, rather than pushing or hitting, I can squeeze my pillow or take some deep breaths or go for a walk. And then that sort of changes my thought process and my feelings. And so we can sort of set it on a new path. Um, in the lower right-hand corner, we have uh, what's a behavior map or a contingency map. And that's another visual that can be used in counseling sessions where you sort of lay out the problem for the individual. So in this example, it would be, um, the problem is that I want to watch my shows and my dad says no. And so then we work with the individual with Down syndrome to sort of play out what are your different behavioral choices. On the one hand, you could scream at dad and slam your bedroom door, but the outcome of that is that now dad is very unhappy with me and I don't get to watch my shows, so it doesn't solve my problem. However, if I want to watch my shows and my dad says no, and I make the behavior choice to ask my dad if I can watch my shows after I do my chores, well, then the outcome is that my dad will feel happy. He'll allow me to watch my shows and that solves my problem. So sometimes seeing it laid out in this way can really help the person with Down syndrome figure out the best course of action and to really sort of start analyzing their behavior and their choices if they are able to do so. Um, for mental health, there is um, the option of medication. So medication is not always necessary, but it shouldn't be ruled out. We know that many mental health conditions are related to chemical imbalances in the brain and the medications can help balance them out. And so it's great if the therapist, the counselor and the prescribing doctor can sort of work together because there are times that we see that the individual, we know they have anxiety or we know they have depression, but they are so impacted by the symptoms of their mental illness that even if they went to counseling five days a week, you know, 
for weeks and weeks, they can't retain the information that it's just not, they're not available for that level of support until medications can sometimes balance it out so that bring them closer to baseline so that they can gain more from the actual counseling sessions. Um, with counseling, we teach coping strategies and develop plans. And we work with the families as well to support the individual's needs. Um, a lot of times um, in the counseling sessions, it does tend to be, in some cases, more directive, where we do say, okay, we're going to create um, this plan. When I feel sad, I will talk to my mom or take some quiet time in my room or write in my journal, because that is we know that a lot of individuals with Down syndrome are good at following written or visual plans, and that can really be helpful to them to know when I start feeling sad, these are my choices and these are the things, the strategies that work for me. And obviously when we're developing these plans, we're working with the individual because what works for one might not work for another. And so they feel that ownership and that control and saying, this is what helps me when I'm having strong feelings. Another important thing that we come, we talk a lot about here at the Adult Down Syndrome Center is how much we encourage activities and engagement. We notice that a lot of times if the individual with Down syndrome is not engaged in social activities or fun activities, that their mental health does suffer. And we see this a lot at the end of high school or the transition program when they go from having completely full schedules to having much fewer um, social activities. So we want, we always encourage, you know, looking for um, special recreation programs, special Olympics, uh, theater programs, art classes to keep, uh, keep them engaged and doing things that they enjoy because that can really be a, have a positive impact on their mental health. We also really want to remember the empathy radar. Like we talked, like Dr. Chicoin talked about um, in the common characteristics, we know that people with Down syndrome have a strong empathy radar, so they do pick up on information and the emotions of others, which is why it's important that, you know, the people that they're spending time with, family, friends, staff, that the way they act and the way they feel, their behavior can rub off on the individual with Down syndrome. So if they can pick up when it's a stressful situation, when people are agitated or irritated, if it's a sad situation. So it's something to be mindful of in our interactions with individuals with Down syndrome that they may really be picking up on what's going on in the environment around them and the people around them. Next slide, please. All right, so life stressors, we know that's a big cause of behavior change. So some strategies for that are preparing when you can. Um, we know that not everything is possible to prepare for. Things happen unexpectedly. But if you do know there are things coming up like your family is moving houses or they're graduating from school or there's an illness of a family member that is looking unfortunately like it may result in death, prepping the person so that they're not complete, completely caught off guard by that. Um, because a lot of anxiety comes from the fear of the unknown. So preparation can help minimize the unknowns and the anxiety in the person with Down syndrome and therefore can help them manage their behaviors better too. Um, another strategy is to reduce unnecessary stressors when possible. We know it's not, we know it's not possible to remove all life stressors and we wouldn't want to do that because being able to cope with stress is an important um, part of life. And um, if we remove too many stressors, that can sort of actually reinforce in the, the individual's mind that it is something to be feared or stressed about. But there are times when we can make some changes to the environment or to our schedule or routine that reduces the number of stressors that they're coming across on a daily basis. Um, we want to try to create plans, determine what is actually the, the cause or the source of the stress and address that aspect of the situation, create a plan for it. Um, using visuals again is another great way to create that plan so that it becomes less stressful for the individual. 
And sometimes counseling is also needed for certain life stressors, right? And that's true for all individuals. There are some times in our lives when there are situations that are just really difficult to cope with. And so it might be really beneficial for the individual with Down syndrome to engage in therapy to help them manage the stress and express themselves appropriately. Next slide, please. Okay, so we talked about the function of the behavior and trying to figure out what the behavior, what is its purpose? What is it serving or doing for the individual? And so this is where it gets a little bit tricky because we want to accurately identify the function so that we address it in the appropriate way. And so you really do have to get kind of curious. We might think we know the function of the behavior, but we might've gotten it wrong. Like the example that Dr. Frank gave, maybe we thought they wanted access to the chocolate bar in the grocery store, but in fact, it was a sensory issue they were having. Um, so another example would be if, if your son suddenly refuses to go to church on Sundays with the family, and you might think the function of that behavior is to avoid a non-preferred activity. Well, if you get curious and sort of look at the whole picture, the whole environment, the whole situation, you might discover that actually we just bought him a new collared shirt and he doesn't like to wear it because it's uncomfortable. So that's why he's refusing to go to church. You really do have to get curious and um, not make assumptions about the function of the behavior so that we can address them appropriately. Just give him a new shirt and he goes back to church. That's a lot easier than trying to create a reward system or something of that nature to meet the need. Um, so when we break it down by the function of the behavior, there are different strategies. So for example, if the person is seeking attention and you might want to schedule regular check-ins with that person, whether that's at school or at work, a preferred person can sort of check in with them every so often, say, hey, how's it going? Give them that attention so that they don't have to seek it out in a negative way. Another way is special jobs, you know, like, oh, I've got this special job for you to do. That makes the person feel good. And then they don't have to seek out attention negatively. Another way is dedicated time to share interests, opportunity, just finding more opportunities for interaction during the day. We know that sometimes the individual might have a job that's less social. And if you go a whole day without talking to many people, you might really want attention and you might go about it in the wrong way. Um, we also always encourage regular praise. Praise is always a good thing. People like that attention. It feels good. And so that can meet that need. Sometimes people uh, avoid attention. They don't want the attention. And so if that's the function of the behavior, building in breaks or teaching social skills for declining attention so that they can refuse or excuse themselves from a situation that makes them uncomfortable. If the function of the behavior is access to either items, activities, or locations, you can create reward systems so that they can earn access to preferred things. You can give choices, um, create in their schedule, plan time for access to the person or the place or the thing. If they know every day at two o'clock I get my tablet, then they might not try to sneak it at other points of the day because they know that they will get it at this regular time. We also use visual timers a lot that can help build patience and also help make the concept of time of having to wait for preferred things more concrete and that can make it um, more manageable for the person with Down syndrome. If the person is trying to escape or avoid something, allow breaks, teach those coping strategies for the things that they cannot avoid, arrange the environment differently, and prep for transitions that might be coming so that they um, are ready for it. And some sensory things, if the function of the behavior is sensory, either seeking or um, avoiding, you can build in movement breaks, sound canceling headphones, adjust the lighting, create quiet spaces where they can go, and provide sensory tools that can help them meet that need in a positive way. So next slide, and I will pass it to Katie. Thank you, Abby. So when it comes with, to communication, we already talked about the discrepancies between the receptive, what we um, understand, and the expressive language, how we're able to talk, and how that can cause behaviors. Um, maybe it's because the person doesn't actually understand what's being said to them, um, but is expressive, so then others assume they have a higher understanding. 
or they use scripted speech. And so it just sounds like they're really conversational, but really they're having a hard time processing what's being said. And it can also cause behaviors if the individual can't get the words out or say what they're feeling or the conversation moves too fast. And so then they try to talk and it sounds like they're off topic. So we wanna really consider the communication supports, whether the person's verbal or nonverbal. Um, visuals, we've talked about that a ton. So visuals are gonna be really helpful to, for someone to be able to communicate their wants and needs. And so there's some low tech strategies that individuals can use for communication, whether it's pictures or gestures or actually handing the items. Um, it doesn't have to be devices that like voice output devices, but that is another option. Uh, sign language is another way that we can um, encourage communication. And again, we want to find ways to help them understand. And so visuals are going to help with that receptive uh, language so that then we can lead to the expressive language. Um, and then when it comes to sensory, uh, the way to address behaviors that are related to sensory would be more from a sensory diet. And this is a planned and structured activity program, and it's highly individualized. So what works for one person may not work for the other, even if they're having the same exact behavior. And when you implement a sensory diet, it helps prevent sensory and emotional overload by satisfying the body's needs. Um, if you've heard me talk about sensory before, I talk about how our, you know, throughout the day, our body kind of is like a teeter-totter and we have our ups and downs. But ultimately, we want to keep our teeter-totter even. And when our teeter-totter is even, we are more open to change and transitions or whatever the environment is throwing at us. We can process it better and, um, and regulate our emotions and um, the way our body processes what we hear or see or touch or taste. When it comes to a sensory diet, it's really more like choosing from a menu than following a recipe. So it's not if this happens, then do this, then this, then this. It's this is happening. Well, let's try this. Oh, that's not working today. Let's try this. It's kind of like having um, those different size flathead and Phillips screwdrivers in your toolbox. You're going to have a toolbox of sensory strategies that are going to be effective because one might not work that day or the person just doesn't want it. It doesn't feel right and they need to try something else. Activities in a sensory diet can be calming or organizing or alerting, and it really depends on the person's needs. The thing that really can be challenging is that in many environments, sensory is used as a reward. So, oh, you didn't do this behavior or you did this so great, you get to go to the sensory room or you get to go for a walk outside. But when it comes to sensory, if that is really the reason for the behavior or the need is established, they need these the sensory diet in order for to attend to a task, it should not be removed as punishment or given as a reward as part in within their behavior plan. And with sensory diets, it really can help a person move through a transition or prepare for a change in routine more easily, but it can be used as a recovery technique if the person does become overwhelmed. And I think I saw real fast that there was a question about um, the school environment and anxiety and sensory and Honestly, it can be hard to differentiate if it's a sensory issue or actually anxiety because your body may feel the same way. Um, so for me, I can't eat oranges. It's like fireworks going off in my mouth. But for someone else, that might then cause anxiety if they see oranges sitting on a plate and they know that that's the feeling they have and then they might become anxious. And so there are some sensory strategies that really help with um, anxiety as well. Uh, and so if there's, you want more information on that, there is a whole webinar that we've done on sensory strategies and it is in our resource library. And I know there'll be information on a resource library later in this, uh, the presentation. So I highly recommend checking that out. So now that we've gone through these causes for behavior and some of the strength sensory strategies, sorry, strategies to address these possible causes, we're gonna look at some case examples so that you can see kind of the process that we might go through in order to try to figure out the cause of the behavior and how to, um, to provide solutions. So again, we talked about all of these different causes. We don't have to go through it again, but just as a reminder. And I think what maybe you've probably seen by um, our descriptions is that it may be helpful to have a um, interdisciplinary approach because again, if you just went to a doctor, they may just look at physical health or mental health 
Um, or if you just went to a behavior therapist, they may only look at the function of behavior, right? Or if you only saw an OT, they wouldn't just look at sensory, but they wouldn't maybe think about all of the things either. So it really helps to have a team approach to address behavior. So here is our first case example. We have Keith, and he is a 30-year-old male who works at a grocery store. And he used to sock shelves and get the carts and um, everything, but he recently started refusing to do those tasks, and all he wants to do is bag the groceries. And so they started thinking, why could this be happening? And in the past, they know that he refused to stock produce because he didn't like the feeling, you know, the, the texture of the produce. It was really damp. He didn't like how that felt on his hands. So they really thought it could be sensory. They couldn't figure out a sensory reason why he would um, want to bag groceries only. They also noticed he started having some more self-talk both at home and at work. So let's think about this and go through the different causes of behavior and see what could be um, the reason behind Keith's change of behavior. So we looked at it. There was no real physical health concerns. Um, we did see as far as the common characteristics, he had a change in self-talk. Uh, the brain anatomy, well, he may have a, a different developing brain than um, other coworkers. Really, that wasn't the, the reason. That wasn't didn't seem to be any of the, the reasons for this refusal behavior. He doesn't have any mental health diagnoses. And when he saw his doctor, he, they didn't come up with um, any new diagnoses. There were no reports of life stressors. And, um, but one thing that came up is that he does have a crush on the new coworker and the new coworker happens to be a cashier. And so the function of his behavior may be attention from this new coworker that he has a crush on. And then we looked at communication and he has difficulty expressing his feelings effectively. Maybe he doesn't really know how to act appropriately and communicate his feelings. But in this case, there really didn't seem to be a sensory concern. So if you look at it, there were three um, areas that could be the causes of behavior. These common characteristics, the function, or what's he getting from his behavior, and then communication. So what do we do when this is the case? So with Keith, when we look at the common characteristics, his increase in self-talk, is it really problematic? Or could his self-talk return to baseline if we incorporate other strategies? So we're going to hold off on the self-talk for now, try to incorporate some other strategies and see if it makes a difference, and then um, returns the self-talk to baseline. When it comes to the function of behavior, we've identified that he likes attention from this coworker. So perhaps we can come up with designated times with the cashier or earning break time with the cashier, but only if she agrees. We can teach appropriate ways to gain attention while he's still doing the other tasks. We can have the cashier check in and praise on him when those other tasks are completed because we talked about how intermittent praise can work, especially when um, we're providing praise for the things that we want to do. Then when it comes to communication, it's important to teach Keith what he should be doing, right? Instead of saying, stop doing this or don't do that, we can teach him effective workplace communication. So maybe teaching him ways to ask his boss for what he wants instead of just refusing, right? Or maybe teaching boundaries. So those social boundaries, um, what's, and again, what's appropriate in the workplace setting. And maybe while we're teaching that, we might have to rearrange Keith's work schedule to make sure that he's not working at the exact same time as this cashier, just to help him learn and practice these skills and then put them back into that situation so that he can be successful. All right, and I'm going to pass it over to Abby for our next case study. Thank you. So here is another example we came up with for Jody. Jody is a 17-year-old female. Recently, she's been spending a lot more time on her morning routine that's in the bathroom, getting organized, getting set in the morning. Um, recently, it, she has appeared a lot more withdrawn and sits alone at the lunch table while at school. Um, she has a diagnosis or a history of depression and hypothyroidism. And she has a teacher who is on maternity leave. So let's go through some of the causes of her behavior. 
the physical health. The doctor has a diagnosis, she has a diagnosis on record of hypothyroidism. So that's significant as we learned from Dr. Chagoin that that can be a cause of behavior change. The common characteristics, the change in her groove, right? Her morning routine has gotten longer. That's something new. In this case, again, we don't think there's any concerns with the brain anatomy um, or any changes in that development. So we're not gonna address that here. Mental health, she got a new diagnosis for depression. She is more withdrawn, she feels, seems sad. So that's significant to know. We do learn going through our assessments that there are some significant life stressors for Jody. She had the death of a grandparent. Um, her older sibling left for college somewhat recently. She has her teacher on maternity leave. So those are, that's a lot of things going on at once. And so, so that can really be weighing on Jody and changing her behavior. So we'll, we will hold off on the function for now. We're not going to discuss that in this situation. And the communication. We also learned that Jody has a communication device that she used, but it got, it was broken. And so she's using a device that's not her typical comfortable device, and it's not personalized for her. Through the assessment, we determined that there aren't any sensory issues. So we're going to focus on the areas that we do have concerns. So that would be the physical health, the hypothyroidism, the common characteristics, change in the groove, mental health, depression diagnosis, the many life stressors, and communication. And we thought this would be an important case example to bring to this webinar because we see a lot of cases like this where there is a lot going on. And so, well, what do we do with all of this? And we kind of like to think about it sort of like the order of operations, right? We got to address certain things first to see if that resolves other areas. So Katie, would you switch to strategies? Very good. So for the physical health, the doctor determines to uh, that she needs an adjustment for her thyroid medication, and that might change her mood as well. Um, the common characteristics, again, just like with Keith, our previous example, we want to find out, is this extended morning routine, is it problematic, or could it return to baseline with other strategies? If the groove work didn't resolve itself with some of the other strategies that we put in place, we there are still think, ways to address it. So you can use visual supports or provide reminders for the morning routine. You can use visual timers or even playlists to remind uh, Jody when certain tasks should be completed by. You can remove tasks from her morning routine if there are things that she doesn't need to do by herself or that you can help facilitate, you can do that to help her move along in the morning. Or you can even adjust her schedule. If she is determined to do an hour and a half long routine, okay, then we have to wake up a little bit earlier so that you have time for that and can make it to school in time. The, for the mental health, if she has a diagnosis of depression, she may need some counseling and or medication. Um, so those would be things to consider with uh, your providers. Life stressors. Again, counseling can be a really helpful strategy to use when there's a lot of stress in their life. You can also at home use positive talk and talk about the stressful situations. A lot of times when we don't bring up stressors, we, oh, we don't want to talk about grandma dying because that's very sad and we don't want to upset Jody but not talking about it can actually increase anxiety and confusion um, and even sadness about the situation. So it's important to use the opportunity to talk with her about it in a positive light and explain what's going on so that it's not so confusing. Why do all these people keep leaving, right? This is a really common theme in Joey's life currently. Death, so a sibling moving away, teachers out, maybe temporarily. That can seem like a common theme and that can be really overwhelming. So take the opportunity to explain and discuss um, and really talk about those feelings she might be having. We use a lot of social stories or visuals to help understand the concepts of death or somebody moving away. Um, those can be really helpful to help. We know they're visual learners. So using those social stories and visuals can help them understand it as well. For communication, we got to get that communication device repaired or 
individualize the temporary one. You can provide low tech communication if needed, but ideally we know that if you need a communication device, that's your voice and not having your voice can cause a lot of distress. Um, so these are the main areas that we would really wanna focus on resolving um, quickly and then sort of seeing if everything falls back in place if she gets closer to being at baseline. Next slide, please. All right, so as we're getting towards the end here, there are some points that we really sort of wanna drive home. Um, after you determine the cause of the behavior and you address it with the strategies like we discussed, unlearning the problematic behavior can take time. And so one way to sort of like try this out for yourself is in your house, move something that you use regularly, maybe like the garbage can in your kitchen, and see how long it takes you to stop going to where it used to be, stop going to its old location, it takes time because we're creatures of habit. And once we start a habit, it can be hard to break it. But we say when changing a behavior and people with Down syndrome, but in general, it gets worse before it gets better. There is probably gonna be some pushback because the way they had been behaving before was meeting their needs. And so when we try to change it, they might fight back on that. But we say, don't give up because if you can push through and form new habits, we can resolve some of the behaviors that were problematic. Another important point to consider is that sometimes we, as the people who surround the individual with Down syndrome, we need to modify our own behavior in order to support their, um, their health and their well being. Um, so, for example, if the individual with Down syndrome likes to collect papers and they'll take any papers, they'll take your important bills and your work documents and they'll sort of shuffle them away somewhere, well, we might have to change our behavior. Get the mail right away and put it in a safe spot where they can't access it, right? Clean up after yourself so they don't have the opportunity to continue that habit or that behavior. Next slide, please. So as a wrap up, a change in behavior is a new action or pattern of actions that are atypical for the individual. That's what we were discussing today. Not all new behaviors need to be changed. Like Dr. Shikwain mentioned, some new behaviors can be really positive and really great. There are a variety of factors that can contribute to a change in behavior. We saw that throughout the presentation. And the strategies to address the behavior change can be unique um, depending on what the cause of the behavior is. And some of these contributing factors overlap, right? We saw that sometimes there's medical, physical, sensory, and that it can sort of be hard to separate them out sometimes. And finally, unlearning behavior takes time once you address it. So don't say, oh, we tried those strategies for two days and it did nothing, so we stopped doing them. Give it a little bit more time and see if new habits stick or changes happen. Next slide. So. As we end our presentation, we always like to remind participants about our resource library. There are so many wonderful resources um, at the Adult Down Syndrome Center li Resource Library. We have all sorts of visuals for different um, strategies that we talked about today, um, tips and advice for families and caregivers or health providers. So absolutely check that out because it might help with a need that you have. Next slide. And now I believe we ha have time for questions, which Laura will be fielding. Yes, thank you so much, Abby, Dr. Shakoin, and Katie. Um, this presentation was wonderful. And we do have time for questions. We're going to um, take questions for about, half, uh, about 20 minutes. And if we don't get to your question, we really encourage you to take a look at our resource library, like Abby mentioned. All right, so diving right in, um, we had a question ab about clarifying the meaning of common characteristics. Um, it Just to be clear about what that means exactly, and um, it seems like it might have been used in a couple different ways. So I, I maybe I can start with that since I talked about that. Um, so, um, you know, first, uh, these are things we see commonly in people with Down syndrome, and, and we're mostly uh, focusing on um, what might be called behavioral characteristics. Um, and, and so uh, self-talk is one of them, for example. And so 
uh, I can tell you how we got interested in this 30 some years ago, we were seeing a lot of our, uh, you know, people that were coming in to see us for appointments on antipsychotic medications. And, and um, as we started to piece through that, we found that they were, had been started on those medications by another provider because basically because they talked to themselves. And as we really looked at that, we found that this was, this was a characteristic of many people with Down syndrome. We thought it was a developmental stage appropriate behavior. We felt it was a very functional thing for most people. And, and it was um, you know, used in a lot of different ways as I, as I mentioned earlier. So uh, we really, in a sense, we thought that this, this was common and, and essentially normal and not abnormal in and of itself. Now, again, when there's a change that, that, that can you know, uh, uh, be an issue. So, um, so that would kind of be the sort of what, what we're talking about there um, and uh, with regards to uh, uh, what we would call common characteristics. Again, I'm probably looking at mostly behavioral things, uh, aspects and, and how they are, are commonly seen in people with Down syndrome and, and if appreciated, uh, can uh, avoid overdiagnosis of certain things or underdiagnosis of, of certain things as well. Uh, another one, for example, is the groove. Um, uh, years ago, we saw a young man that was in school and, and uh, he, one of the kind of the subcategories of the groove or some parts of the groove is that many people with Down syndrome like to take a task all the way to the finish. And so once they're started on something, the groove is going and they, and they have to go all the way through to the end. And so this young man was in school and the teacher had a tendency towards uh, making, you know, giving a, basically a 20 minute assignment at the last 10 minutes of class with the intention of, um, uh, you know, doing the, la the second 10 minutes of the project and the first 10 minutes of the next, you know, the next day or, or whatever. And so uh, while that worked okay for the rest of the students, for our young uh, man with Down syndrome that was in the, in the class, uh, you know, he got to the end of the first 10 minutes and he, and he wanted to keep going and he wanted to finish the project. And so now there was a behavioral challenge in a sense with, you know, it was time to go to the next class or move on to whatever, you know, whatever the case was at the end of that first 10 minutes. And so uh, helping the, the teacher understand that this was a common thing in people with Down syndrome that, the, you know, they do have this groove and they do have this tendency towards wanting to finish a, a, a task all the way through. Um, and once that was uh, explained, uh, it was changed, the way the approach was changed. And so the project was divided up into two 10 minute sections uh, with a you know definition of the first one being 10 minutes and the second one being 10 minutes rather than one of 20 minutes. And, and that was simp that simple technique was enough to, to address the uh, behavioral change. So again, those are just sort of common things. Uh, and again, they're common, but not universal, but if, if remembered, uh, they can have both a, a diagnostic benefit as well as a, you know, we talked about using visuals for strong visual memories. Um, you know, they can have a, a benefit when uh, addressing uh, changes as well. Thank you very much. We also have links to webinar recording, uh, links to recordings of webinars that um, Drs. Coyne and Katie have done on self-talk and the groove. And um, those are available in our resource library. Okay, so another question was, do behavior changes look different depending on the age of a person with Down syndrome? So for example, what behavior changes might you see in an adolescent going through puberty versus an aging adult who may be developing Alzheimer's disease? And you guys want to pick that? Want me to take it? So, uh, you know, certainly I think with the with the, uh, Alzheimer's disease, and we do have a lot of information on Alzheimer's disease in our resource library as well, there are certainly patterns of change that, that are common. And, and so those would be things to look at. Um, some Again, some of it may be in, increase in the groove or decrease in the groove. Uh, you know, we may see more self-talk or less self-talk. You know, there's a lot of those things you may see a change in. Certainly memory impairment is, is a contributing factor. Um, and, and sometimes, uh, you know, the impulse control issues become more problematic or the, the ability to, to uh, understand and, and follow, you know, sort of social norms can be challenging for people as they, as they develop uh, Alzheimer's disease, unfortunately. Um, so similarly, uh, you know, in some ways, the, there's a similar theme in the, in, the, in the folks going through puberty, but the, but the situations and the stressors are different, uh, typically. And so you may see 
um, you know, there's a lot of expectation at that age for, uh, you know, social uh, appropriateness, if you will, uh, and, and following the crowd or whatever the case may be. So there may be some issues that are you might not see in an older person, but that you would see uh, in a situational sense uh, with the folks that are uh, in school, for example, going through puberty. Um, it's just a rough thing. Katie or Abby, anything to add to that? Well, what I was going to add about puberty is, you know, what happens or it can happen earlier than the teenage years in individuals with Down syndrome, but um, they're just going to act like typical teenagers. And unfortunately, the individuals with Down syndrome are constantly under a microscope and everyone's analyzing everything that they do instead of realizing like, hey, maybe that's just developmentally appropriate or age appropriate because they're they're going through puberty. And so they're going to start telling their parents no, or they're going to huff and puff if you ask them to do something. Um, and so it'll appear like a refusal behavior, but really that's just what a 13-year-old would do when the parent asks them to take out the garbage or whatever it might be. Um, so again, it's also remembering what's appropriate for the age. Um, and so again, maybe it's not actually a problematic behavior. Thank you. Our next question at, um, is asking, have you experienced someone who has some bursts of laughter, typically in private or only with family members? Um, I can start, I guess. Yeah, so we've seen that. And I, when we hear from families, I know there's often a lot of concerns about psychosis or a hallucination that's causing them to act that way. Um, and it's hard to say, it depends sort of on how much the person can express what's going on. It might be the case that they are just processing something from earlier in the day or with that strong visual memory. Maybe they're thinking about, oh, I watched this funny video and I'm just now thinking about it and it caused me to laugh. And again, thinking about is the behavior problematic at this point, right? Um, I certainly understand the concern about are they having hallucinations or not? Um, at the same time, if it's, you know, just every so often, if they're just laughing, it's a burst of laughter in private or with family members, that doesn't necessarily seem like it would need to be addressed. Um, but it, it, it can be hard, I understand, to, you know, sort of determine, are they having a hallucination or is this just their processing something that they're thinking about reflecting on their day? I don't know if Katie or Dr. Shagoyne have anything to add to that? I would just add that I think sometimes you're described more, uh, the question was more in private, you know, in, in family, in private. I mean, I think we certainly see this sometimes in, in folks out in the community where there's there's sort of a, not necessarily a social, true social anxiety, but there's a social nervousness where they don't really know how to manage the situation. And so uh, they may just laugh. Uh, and, and, you know, in response to something that's going on. So I, I think that's one thing I say. And I would just also reiterate what Abby said about, um, you know, the strong visual memory. Um, and, and the other challenge with the, the strong visual memory for some folks is the, is the, is the difficulty with understanding time in, in a typical fashion. And so they may be thinking about something that's from well in the past and, and sort of in their mind, in their strong visual memory, almost thinking like it's, it's a recent event or something that's, you know, just occurred. And so they may they may respond to it as as Abby mentioned with a laugh that would seem to be out of place, uh, but in the context of what's going on in their in their mind, it may be perfectly perfectly reasonable. Thank you. Our next question asks: Have you seen more social anxiety in people with Down syndrome since the pandemic? I think that we would probably all agree that yes, we have. Um, we we know we attribute a lot of it to the fact that they a lot of people with Down syndrome really do like their routines, and we were in that pandemic phase of no one goes out, no one gets into large groups for so long that many of them developed new routines that involved only their family or only a small group or just staying at home, and so that idea of going back out it's starting over, it's starting a brand new routine and that can be really hard. So we definitely have seen some of that social anxiety. I know with some of our patients, they, like we said, that empathy radar, they pick up on everything. So we, you know, notice that in some families who um, were very nervous or cautious about the pandemic, that those 
that they, the people with Down syndrome, they internalize that as well. And maybe they're still un, very nervous or cautious themselves about, well, everything is full of germs out there. I'm, I don't want to go out because that's what they heard for two years and not, not incorrect, but it can be harder for them to recognize there are new things in place. We have vaccines. We've sort of learned to, that this is something we're going to be living with in the future. And that can just be hard for them to understand. So that has definitely created some a lot more social anxiety. Great, thank you. This question says, my son is unable to verbally communicate when he is in pain. Do you have suggestions for how to determine if a behavior change is the result of, of, of pain or an illness or something else? I could take that. Um, so I, it, it can be very challenging. And, and honestly, we miss things regularly because you just don't have the same you know, signs or symptoms that you might have in someone else. So I think the first thing is to, is to have, have a curious uh, sense of things. So uh, think pain, think physical, if there's a change in behavior and, and what else might you see? Um, you know, he's, he's been a little grumpier and, and, you know, he's just walking just a little bit different. Uh, you know, maybe there's something wrong with his ankle or, or whatever. Um, you know, he's, uh, uh, not been able to sleep. Um, and he's been, uh, you know, drinking soda late in the evening and, and, uh, you know, maybe, you know, maybe there's some heartburn that's causing, you know, during the night that's, you know, causing him to, to wake up. So you really kind of got to be, as Dr. McGuire, uh, former social worker used to say, we, we got to be detectives. We got to keep looking. We got to dig in. Um, and, and, uh, and sometimes you don't see it on the first go around and you see it on the second go around or the third go around. You got to keep thinking and, and just keep, keep it in mind that that is a possibility. Uh, because in, unless you're considering it as a possibility, you're very likely to overlook it. And it's hard not to overlook it even when you're thinking about it. So it's, it's, a, it's a challenging thing. Thank you. Has your office noticed any behavior problems when an individual develops cataracts? I can take that one again. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think the loss of, of, a, of, a, of vision is a, is a very challenging thing for a lot of people with Down syndrome. Um, several years ago, we saw a, a gentleman uh, in his early 50s that we hadn't seen for a couple of years. And um, when I saw him two years before, there was no evidence of cataracts on the exam. Uh, and, and sometimes it happened in, ended up happening. This gentleman, the cataracts develop more rapidly sometimes in folks with Down syndrome. So in the two years that uh, between then and now when I saw him, the, the, the individuals that brought him to the appointment were concerned that he had developed uh, dementia because his, his function was so much different. Um, and what had happened in the two years, he had developed very dense cataracts. And, and so his, his treatment was actually cataract surgery and, and he returned to his baseline. So absolutely, we see all sorts of functional and behavioral changes in people that have uh, impaired vision, whether it's cataracts or some other reason. Thank you. All right. This question says that um, uh, their loved one is 39 years old and he struggles with not getting hugs from our granddaughter when leaving. She's four and is refusing hugs from him and sometimes all of us. And he has a large outburst of anger at not getting a hug and it gets intense. This is the only grandchild, so he has never really been around small children for long periods. So I think this would be a wonderful opportunity to uh, talk about establishing boundaries and, um, and saying that we all give permission for when and how someone touches us. And it's always great to ask permission. So maybe if he can ask if, if he can get a hug and then see what she says. And then also you have to kind of talk about handling rejection when someone tells no, tells you no. Um, does he respond like that when you tell him no for other things? Have you ever had to tell him no? Like, no, he doesn't get that treat or no, he can't have a soda or no, he, um, 
can't spend time with a sibling or whatever it may have been um, and trying to help them understand. And there's visuals on all of this in our resource library about boundaries and consent and um, appropriate touch and handling rejection. Um, and so you could use this as a teaching opportunity. Um, and also to say like, look, she's not hugging me either today. Maybe Maybe she just doesn't want to hug and 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 use it use the teachable moment as an opportunity for him to learn that it's okay that she doesn't want to hug and it has nothing to do with him or her feelings towards him. I don't know if Abby, you have something anything additional to add. Yeah, I would I would say the same thing and practicing it. So when your granddaughter is leaving, say showing him asking by asking her, "Can I have a hug?" and practicing with him at home. And sometimes if he asks, "Can I have a hug?" try saying no. If he never hears no, that first time is going to be like, what? What just happened? So practicing and modeling your responses, or if, you know, you and another family member, member can sort of act it out saying, can I have a hug? And they say, not right now. I'm not in the mood. Okay. I understand maybe later so that he can see what that appropriate social interaction looks like. Thank you. This question says um, that my husband and I are divorced and our son is becoming resistant to going to his dad's each weekend. He says he is not comfortable. And after extensive talks, we're not sure if it is really something going on there or if he doesn't want to leave me. We have both had discussions with him, but we're still unsure even after reassuring him that I'm fine at home on the weekends. I don't know if there's a way uh, when he is at his dad's for him to be able to set a certain time where he can call you so that he can see that you're okay. And maybe that will help with his reassurance. Uh, but it would be interesting to see, has anything changed at dad's house? Is it that he doesn't like his room at dad's house or someone's there that um, hasn't been there from the beginning? Or is there you know, something about the environment that really makes it hard and it isn't about um, mom at all. I mean, there's still so many things to think of. And again, trying to be that detective to see what's exactly different. Um, I don't know if dad's house is new and the house you're in is the um, house that he grew up in or the house that you all lived in together before the divorce. And that could be the difference. Um, and so just trying to get used to the new environment. Um, and I don't know what he's doing. He just says he doesn't want to go to dad's, but then he he agrees and just goes reluctantly. Or I mean, do he and dad have a good time together once he's there? Um, I think there's still so many things, questions to ask to try to uh, to help figure that one out. Thank you, Katie. All right, this question says that we've been hearing more about the need for people with Down syndrome to add iron supplements. Is this something to consider for sleep or other behavior concerns? Yeah, I think we're still uh, we're still learning about it, um, but I, I think it is definitely something to, to think about when there's a, a behavior change or when there's a sleep problem that uh, we are finding out more that uh, people with Down syndrome probably do have uh, some iron deficiency anemia at times that can contribute to some of those problems. Thank you. Sorry, there are so many. <laughs> Thank you for submitting your questions, everyone. Um, so you mentioned the transition out of high school. Do you have any ideas on how to develop healthy outlets, building their community and filling their day outside of the seemingly big desire for just screen time? I can start. Um, yeah, we we really encourage um, participation in extracurricular outside um, activities, get out of the house as much as possible, because once they're out doing things, things they enjoy, the less desire there is for that screen time. So if there are activities, if they're into theater or fitness, there are all sorts of um, community organizations that um, have those kinds of outlets. If that's not a possibility due to where you live or funding or whatever might be the case, we recommend trying to make structure throughout the day at home, making routines where you sort of 
we we love our vis visual schedules, but ways to like create a daily plan where it's, you know, I do my chores, I make my meals, I clean up after my meals, I do my exercise or I take my walk and, you know, building screen time in if that's something that you want to do to that schedule, but not just allowing them well, you don't have work, you don't have school, so you just get to hang out because we all get antsy, right? Some free time is great, but when you have too much of it, that can create problems and then more resistance when there is something that they need to do or that you want them to do. No, I'd rather stay home or I'd rather sit at home. But if they're in the habit of doing things throughout the day or getting out of the house, it's easier to keep it, right? An object in motion stays in motion. Um, an object at rest will tend to stay at rest. So we that's why we really encourage those activities. Um, structured activity is the other thing we tend to find is that the sleep-wake cycle kind of gets uh, confused. So they're gonna stay up later at night and then sleep all day because there's nothing for them to wake up for or to do. And so then it gets even harder to get them up and moving and out of the house when there's activities that do need to happen, whether it's doctor's appointments or you finally got the funding and you um, have programming for them to go to. And now all of a sudden they sleep until 12 and you're supposed to be there at nine and then it's going to be a struggle. Um, so definitely trying to keep some form of structure, even if it's not formal activities outside of the home. Um, perhaps finding peers that could take the individual out. Um, oftentimes there's, if there's different therapy programs, there's universities in your area. And so OT, PT, speech, you know, maybe social work, whatever psychology students would be interested in having an opportunity to spend time with your loved one and taking them out. And then the loved one, your loved one's going to be more inclined perhaps to go out because it's with someone that they seem as a peer instead of a parent. Um, that sometimes can be a good choice, even if it's just for like an hour and they go to the store. Thank you. Abby, you had mentioned that sometimes it takes time to, for these changes to, uh, I'm sorry, for the, um, the strategies to address these changes to, to kind of work. How do you know how long, um, when you've tried it long enough and for behavioral strategies as well as for medications? Well, medications are different because they're kind of their own, you know, beast, right? Some medications take longer to build up in the system and to see their effects than others. And some have more of an instantaneous effect. It sort of depends on the medication. Um, for behavioral strategies, it's a, it's going to be a minute. So like, I mean, they say like it can take three weeks to build a habit, but with someone with Down syndrome and intellectual disability, it probably will take longer. It depends on the habit and how well the um, new strategies are meeting the needs. Um, if they are completely meeting the needs, if there are maybe, this happens a lot, that it can be really hard to con completely control the environment if the person lives in, you know, a residential setting, maybe not all the staff are fully on board with the behavioral intervention strategies, and that can make it take longer, or that can sort of throw it out of whack, or maybe it's different family members say, oh yeah, come on, I'll let you get up. You can get on the iPad now, when everyone else was like, no, we weren't going to do that. So it really just sort of depends on how well the strategies are being applied, how, you know, with fidelity, um, and it, it does take several weeks um, try it for four weeks, six weeks, it, it takes some time. And that's why we also say we really focus on one behavior change at a time. The individual might have all sorts of issues that you want to address. You want them to eat healthier. You want them to exercise. You want them to go to bed earlier. It's best to focus on one at a time when possible to see the results um, sort of unfurl more effectively and more uh, quickly. Thank you so much, Abby. And thank you to everyone who had um, has submitted questions. Unfortunately, we are just about out of time. Um, I did want to uh, point out one resource that we have on our resource library, and that is um, the second edition of the mental wellness book that Dr. Chapoin and Dr. McGuire wrote. After Woodbine House Publishing went out of business, they decided to make it um, 
available free of charge as a PDF. So that is on our website. If you go to adscresources.advocatehealth.com, there's a big yellow banner. And if you click on that, you'll be able to access that resource. And so we um, thank you so much for joining us today. And Abby, Dr. Quinn, and Katie, if you have any last words, please feel welcome to share. No, I just appreciate y'all joining, joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and look for the recording and the webinar slides in your inbox in the next few days. We hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye.